All right. Very cool. So today, uh, I'm really excited to have Jared here with us. Jared, welcome, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex, for having me and everyone who's in attendance today. I'm really excited to, to talk a little bit more about pitching and podcasts, share a little bit about what we do at One Pitch, and hopefully everyone can at least, you know, come away with this conversation, learning at least a thing or two. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited to dive into this. So, I mean, I, I'm very curious myself um, about how to improve pitches. Like I, I have a pretty good format. I like to think because it converts decently. At least I hear back from people, but um, uh, you've been in this space for a while. Can you give a little bit about your background and what you guys do over there? And then we'll kind of, uh, we'll dive into some actual questions. And I'll open up for everybody to ask questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the, the co-founder and chief operations officer at One Pitch. And One Pitch is a software as a service platform. And we specifically help um, individuals who are pitching on behalf of brands or who represent those brands figure out which journalists they should connect with. And then we also help them get in touch with those journalists through our platform. And we launched the service in September of 2017. So we're just coming up on our, our four year mark. Um, we've, I hate to say the word pivot, but we have pivoted a little bit uh, since we started the service. Um, we just most recently launched a new matching model, which uses some artificial intelligence and machine learning to essentially analyze pitches that um, the users submit and then compare those with journalists' articles. So we can basically go through our database. We've got about almost 90,000 articles, I believe. Um, we scan through there. We find like terminology, similar subject matter, and then give those users a list of the most relevant journalists that they can connect with. Man, that's super fascinating. Like, that's really cool that you guys have been able to to do that. I'm I'm definitely curious myself about learning more, and I've I've already done a, a little bit of like a dive into your website, and it's it's done really well. So, congratulations to you guys. Seems like you guys have got great traction for being still not not too old, less than five years still, right? Or right at that? Yeah, yeah. We're we 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 feel like we've been doing this for a while, but in the grand scheme of things, we're still a fairly young startup. Um, and the cool part about it is that we've been bootstrapped since day one. Nice. And I, I think love that's that. a really reassuring message, especially in today's you know business world where a lot of people are seeking venture backing. Um, you know, there's still that uh, that proof that you can do it on your own if you're really willing to. Yeah, absolutely, man. Actually, so Podmatch just hit one year old two days ago, and uh, same thing. We we started bootstrap. So thanks, Professor Pete. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so we, we started off uh, bootstrap. And we, we haven't had to raise any capital. We've just been doing our best to just serve the people that have been trusting us. I believe that's probably the same model you guys are using. And the more we just take care of those people, they've been willing to share it and help us grow. So, um, mm -hmm. but anyway, really excited about this. So I, it kind of led me straight into a question, something you just shared, and then I'll, I'll open up for everyone else to ask questions as well. But you've kind of helped the system decide what's good, right? Like this AI that you have built in there and this algorithm, if you will, someone had to kind of start teaching it. Is there a general framework that you say, like all pitches should start this way or have this, or does it kind of depend on the industry and things like that? You know, it really, I think it's kind of each way. So that there is kind of a general template, if you will, that we found that works really, really well. And this is actually something that we created uh, in-house. And we did a lot of market research when we first started the company. We talked with PR professionals. We talked as well with journalists. And we know first and foremost, email is the, the number one vehicle to pitch. Journalists wanna receive pitches via email, PR pros, marketers, you know, everyone who's pitching is probably most comfortable pitching via email. Um, so when we, we found that out, then we said, okay, how does this you know, layout or template look? And of course, you know, emails have a subject line, but then in the body of the message, what we found was that there's really two key components. What are you pitching? and being specific about what you're pitching, and then explaining why that is relevant to the recipient as well as to their audience. So if we, we've created this forum on one pitch where we've broken that up and we've actually helped PR professionals, they've given us this direct feedback that not only are they crafting better pitches, but they're also being more succinct as a result of that. So we're, we're kind of retraining um, this, this method that's been done for a long time. Um, and there's, you know, tons of industry reports that will tell you, you know, how journalists want to be pitched or the length of pitches and that such. Um, but again, I think our, our huge benefit was just really going directly to our market and asking them and then kind of doing some trial and error to figure out what worked best. That's really interesting. So the two key components are what are you pitching and be specific about it? And then why is it relevant to the person you're pitching it to and or their audience? Now, mm -hmm. along with both those things. I immediately started thinking about like 
what I could share there. And I could see they could get pretty lengthy pretty quick. Like I could do a paragraph on each pretty easily. Do you yeah. find that that's a bad thing to do? Or is it better? Like, is it better to keep it shorter? Or is it better just to share as much as you can at one time? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I always recommend to keep it short for starters. Um, but there, there is kind of a caveat to that. And I think the big thing, um, it goes down to relationships. If you don't have a relationship with someone, if you're reaching out to them cold, chances are they don't want to receive a huge paragraph information. They don't even know who you are, right? <laughs> so keeping it short, kind of making that very simple introduction and kind of putting something on their radar is a great starting point for a cold relationship. If you've worked with someone for a while, though, or you know, if, if you have a relationship established with them, giving something that's a little bit longer and more elaborate is more appropriate in that sense. And this is not necessarily coming from me and my own opinions. This is actually also coming from some of the feedback that we get on our podcast through the journalists that we interview. And a lot of them blatantly say that, you know, if you're going to send me a pitch and I don't know who you are, tell me who you are first. Don't just try to pitch me and get me to write about something immediately. We need to establish some sort of rapport and build from there. Um, so to answer your question, Alex, yeah, I would say for starters, you know, generally keeping it short and succinct is, is the most beneficial way. And then again, as you kind of build that relationship and you maintain that over time, um, it gives you more opportunity, again, to, to provide more information, to, you know, ask them if they're working on anything, to be a resource for what they're working on. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different tactics which we can discuss, but yeah, I would say keep it short for starters. Okay. Yeah. I want to get into some of those tactics. I'm glad that you brought that up and it makes sense. I mean, if I had a relationship with somebody, I'd want to give them the information because they probably want to hear from me at, at that point. Right. Um, but initially maybe not. So as a podcast guest or host, either way we're pitching people, but we never really have that relationship with who we're pitching. Sometimes we'll be going back to somebody, but for the most part, it's a fresh outreach, likely out of nowhere. Like it wasn't expected by the person receiving it. What would yeah. you recommend for, for us to keep it short, but also still get enough of our message across that makes sense that they'd even want to respond or, or learn a little bit more even. Yeah. Yeah. So I think two, two very simple things that you can implement hyperlinks and attachments. Um, that way you're not having to write everything. If you have a web page, you can direct them to a hyperlink to that page, you know, Hey, here's some more information you can read here. Then you don't have to take up all of that real estate within the email. Secondary to that attachments are always good. You know, maybe you want to provide a headshot or maybe for example, you have a press release that you've written up. Um, again, it kind of, it allows that, that message to be smaller and more succinct, but then it gives them that additional resource that they can reference if they want to look at it. That's real. I, you know, I've never thought about using an attachment before. That's actually a pretty good idea. It almost makes it more personal, if you will, as well. Right. Like if I actually decide to, to like put a headshot in there, like not that they need that right then, but it still, it shows like a face to, to the, the little email that I'm sending. And then I have done emails because I, I used to write up a little bit too much about like certain episodes of my podcast because mm -hmm. I want them to be able to hear it. So it's, it used to be pitching guests and now I'm using, I, I do that directly through Podmatch, like most people that are attending here today, but I mm -hmm. still want to make sure that I have some sort of link. So I'm not sending like this, this book. So instead of being like, Hey, here's an episode I did with so-and-so it was about this, this, and this, and this instead, what I did was, um, uh, I would just actually have a certain episode that I like to share or that I thought was relevant to that individual. And I would just send them a link straight to them and be like, and here's an episode for reference. So like I took three sentences out by saying all of it and just go into a link instead. Does that make sense what I'm sharing there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I have a very similar example with um, a lot of the journalists that I contact for our show, because I'm, I'm the person who does all of the bookings and all of the, the scheduling. And a lot of times we've worked with a journalist who, you know, works at the same outlet as somebody else that we want to work with. And I'll very, very often what I will do is I will link to their colleagues episode and just say, Hey, you know, again, and it kind of establishes that trust, like your colleague trusted us. They did this interview. They had a great time. We'd love to invite you now, but also here's a reference point in case, you know, you want to learn the format or if you don't believe me, then at least, you know, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we, we are legit and we did have people who were also from your publication who uh, have joined us on the show. That brings up a really cool point. And I did this one time, not even really thinking about it. Uh, cause I, like I said, I have like an episode that I just like to share and I always try to change it up. So I'm, I'm sharing different episodes, but one time, again, this was a mistake and now I do it every time I shared an episode and before I hit send, I just went to that person's LinkedIn page or something like that. And I realized that the guest, the, the, the guest, um, that I had interviewed that I was going to show them was actually a friend of theirs. They were having a conversation like publicly on LinkedIn. 
So mm -hmm. I went back to the email, and just said, Hey, and I, I actually had an interview with one of your friends on it. And here was the link. And when I sent that, they responded right away. They're like, well, if you already had, his name was Walt. If you already had Walt on the podcast, I don't even need to read anything else. I'll, I'll come on your podcast as well. So that was like a light bulb moment for me. Cause I'm like, oh, I should always look to see if I know anybody they know. And if I already have a relationship with them, somehow introduce that because that just, that breaks down a barrier immediately. Cause it's like, oh, well, if Alex trusts Jared, then I should trust Jared too type of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny that we've seen the same thing. Not so much maybe that I've like pitched with them, but people have come back to me and said that, or, you know, I've seen um, journalists interact with each other on Twitter and, you know, uh, an example, Sophia Kanthara, she joined us on our first season of the podcast at the time she was at crunch based news and she was working with Alex Wilhelm. Uh, since then, they've both kind of went their separate ways to different publications. Uh, but when we approached Alex about being our first guest for season two, he was like, Oh yeah, I would love to. I, I know Sophia was on there. He's like, I know Carrie Flynn was on there. And uh, another kind of funny story, I won't elaborate too much, but Alex, I was persistent with him for almost a year trying to get him to get on the show. And it was, you know, not a good time or he wasn't interested. And finally, we were able to get him booked. And I, I kind of felt really, you know, happy about it only because during the episode, he actually was like, you know, he shouted me out and he was like, Jared, thanks for your persistence. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. And again, just goes back to show not just persistence, but those relationships really really do play a part in that whole process. Yeah, I'm going to circle back to some other questions, but I want to kind of pivot here for a minute and then I'm going to open up for everybody. But because you're just talking about the persistence, I did that one time as well. I had a, a person, his YouTube channel is named Devin Supertramp, which is kind of a funny name, but he has like, uh, I don't know, 6 million plus people on uh, following him on YouTube alone. And he, I've been a fan of his since he started. So like I kept on asking him and it took a while. Like I think I emailed him for probably six months before he's finally like, okay, and then he's like, man, I never go on podcasts. He goes, but your persistence is the only reason I'm here. He goes, I really never do this. I turned down all the big names too. He's like, but you kept on showing up. Here's a question. How do you do this, but not be annoying? <laughs> because I think I was probably borderline. Thankfully, he and I actually have a friendship now because I, I must not have been, but my mind's like, man, is this getting annoying? I can't tell. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Because it's a fine line, I'm guessing. It is a very fine line. And this is a very similar line that PR professionals also have to tread lightly with. Um, and I, I mean, I, I want to think that there's a clear cut answer, but there really isn't. Uh, when it comes down to it, it's, it's all based on preference. Some people don't mind if, if you follow up with them, you know, a couple days later. Um, other people don't want to follow up because they've looked at it and they've disregarded your message, but they don't tell you that, right? <laughs> so I, I think there's like this magic sweet spot, um, at least like if you're, if you're going to send out your first email and you haven't heard back within three to five days, that's a safe space. By no means do you want to reach out to them the day after and the day after that and the day after that, right? Then you're kind of just being a nag and eventually, you know, you're going to turn them off to the idea. Um, but it also, you know, after that three to five day mark, what I find is about two weeks after that. And especially with the folks that I work with, they're getting pitched by a bunch of other people. So their inbox is already cluttered to begin with. So a lot of times they just might miss the message. So giving them that follow-up just kind of brings it back to the top of their inbox. Um, and a lot of times, especially if they're not interested, they're going to tell you. Um, but most often, again, three to five days for that first follow up. And I would say about a week to two weeks after that for the second, if you still haven't heard back. I typically will even wait like a month later and contact them. Um, and then if, by the third time, if I haven't heard back, then it's OK. That's just, you know, it's dead in the water. I'm not going to waste any more time on that. Right. Now, when you're doing these follow-ups, do you respond to the same email? Like simple question there. Or do you respond so they can see the trail or do you do a brand new email? Absolutely. Every time, unless I'm contacting them about something completely different, I always respond to the same message. I'm not changing the subject line or anything. I'm just, again, showing them that I've been persistent. Um, a lot of times, even when I, you know, if it's a month later, I'll just mention in my message, Hey, you know, I tried to reach you about a month ago. I didn't hear back. I wanted to see if you were interested or not. If you are, let me know. If you're not also let me know so I can stop bothering you. And a lot of times when I put that last line into there, I will at least get a yes or a no back from folks. Cool. That, that's interesting. And when you're saying those follow-ups, are they usually just a shorter, like you're not redoing the entire pitch necessarily. It's just a shorter, like, Hey, bumping this to the top type of thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really, I mean, again, when it comes down to it, there, there's some terminology that, that turns off journalists specifically like, Hey, just wanted to follow up or, you know, kind of, I can't think of like the way you would explain that phrase, <laughs> but a lot of times what I do is I'll just say, you know, are you, are you still interested? Because if, if they at least responded to the first one, then I know that there's interest there. If they didn't, 
hey, you know, I wanted to see we have some dates coming up. Uh, if the time that I reached out to you wasn't good, is there a better time that I can reach back? Or if not, again, I just I just want you to let me know so I can leave you alone. So you're saying don't use the words follow up? Those don't go over well? They don't go over well. No. Oh, man, I'm super <laughs> guilty of that I use the word follow up all the time. Um, I've got notes here not to do that, though. And is there like science behind that? Or you just know from experience? Like what makes you say that? It's, it's like a trigger word for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. Um, I think with journalists specifically, you know, they're, most of them are well-educated um, and most of them, re, you know, they, they write much better than the, the average Joe, like myself, especially. Me too. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that like they, they look at you as like, you're not smart or anything, but they just hate that work for some reason. And I, I haven't figured out why we have a, in our podcast, we have a mad lib at the end. And a lot of them use follow up as like this trigger word that they see in an email. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I don't know if there is a clear cut answer, but my my advice would be just just remove it from your vocabulary or at least from your email vocabulary. And you know, you can really say the same thing four or five different ways, probably more than that. So I always recommend, even if you're writing the message, write like two or three different versions and see which one you know makes the most sense. It's a, it's a great point. Okay, cool. I'm taking a lot of notes here, by the way, Jared. So thanks for what you're adding here. Um, yeah, to go back to kind of the beginning, and then I'm gonna open it up to everybody here. We talked about the two key components, one being what are you pitching and be specific about it. So for us, it's either for us to be a guest on their podcast or for us to uh, have them as a guest on our shows, but you know, either way, but then like, why is it relevant? And why, like, why how's it relevant to their audience as well? What do you recommend in podcasting that we share at that point? Because for me, if I'm gonna have a guest on, I suppose I could get into a little bit more of, hey, it'll help drive book sales. And it's an entrepreneurship podcast and your books for entrepreneurs. Like that's a very easy example. and makes a lot of sense. But what if it's a little bit more complex? Like how would you go about articulating that really briefly? And I'm just throwing you on the spot here, Jared. So just feel free just to share whatever you got. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. Uh, from, a, from a guest perspective, you know, I, I always kind of put, put myself into like the sales mindset. If you know, if I'm selling to this person, what, what is like their end goal? What do they want out of this? Is it exposure, right? Is it the, a platform for them to provide insight on a subject that they're an expert in? Um, and, and I think, I mean, at the end of the day, right, podcasts are, are kind of just that, that opportunity for people to showcase who they are and what they do. So it is kind of like an interview in a sense, or, you know, again, sharing some of those insights. So when it comes down to why is it relevant? Why is it interesting? You know, again, I kind of just go back to like that sales mindset. What is this person going to benefit from? And how do I explain that to them in a way that give that makes it valuable to them and, and makes them not want to say no? And I think if I can reverse it too, like from a, from a show pitching to a, a guest perspective, right? Um, or excuse me, from a, a guest to a host perspective, um, the same kind of thing is, okay, if I want to be on your show, why am I so interesting? Why am I so unique? What, you know, what have I done that nobody else has, or maybe some other people have, but I've done it better. Or, you know, I have this, this really special niche that, uh, again, brings kind of a unique perspective to the table. And a lot of that, you know, again, you can find through listening to episodes, hearing what other people have to say, kind of finding that open opportunity that hasn't been discussed yet or that hasn't been brought to the table. It's good points, man. I love that. I'm going to, um, I've got plenty more questions, Jared, but I'm going to be kind to all <laughs> my friends in here today. Uh, does anybody have a question for Jared? They like to ask, uh, to ask or a comment they want to throw in there. Um, I cannot see everybody, uh, right now. Cause the way they have this thing laid out, um, I'm recording. So I'm not going to change that, but if anyone just wants to unmute and ask a question, feel free to do that. I'll kind of open it up. I got a question. All right, Nathan, go for it. Let's hear it. If so, I know this is kind of one and the same, but when you're pitching, do you focus mostly on describing the value that you're bringing to the person's audience or to the host themselves? That's a great question, Nathan. I think, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I think for, you have to have good conversation on a podcast or else people aren't going to listen. So it's important to drive that connection to the host. But I think at the end of the day, right, shows are supported through their listeners. So it's equally as important to prove to that person that you're reaching out to, whether it be the producer or the host themselves, that, you know, this is why this person would be a great fit for their audience. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's gonna make <laughs> sense. Anybody else got a question? Jordan, I always love your backgrounds, man. I know you just have it faded out. I it takes us off topic there a little bit, but I every time I see it, I'm like, man, that looks so sweet. But anyway, if anyone else has another question, feel free to unmute and ask. If not, I'm gonna keep on going here, but I'll give everyone a, a minute. Uh, this is Irvin. Um, hey, Jared. Um, a question about: um, Do you ever think there's a place for video emails um, to to use in pitching? That's a great question, Irvin. Especially because I have not tried that yet. <laughs> um, but I, I absolutely do. I think there's there's a, a very personal component to having video versus just looking at text. And I know this is kind of something newer, at least in terms of you know incorporating video into emails. I would highly recommend it. Um, okay. I think not only does it, again, provide that per personal component, but it also kind of gives them a preview of, of you and your personality, how you would be interacting with them, right? Are yeah. you comfortable behind the camera, for yeah. example? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I would 100% recommend that. Cool. Uh, that's a good question, Irvin. I like that. Does anybody have any experience doing this? I'd love to hear from somebody who's done a little bit of this, just to hear if, if somebody has or not. Well, the only thing that I've ever done was send a couple of links to podcasts that I've done and said, if you want to do a brief listen. And I think that's been very effective because I haven't had anybody turn me down because of the quality of, I mean, one was a video and one was an audio. So they get an idea, a little bit of both of what I do and how I appear on camera. So I think that's, a, a it, I, apparently it works. I just thought everybody was doing that. <laughs> you could tell I'm a newbie. No, <laughs> that's, that's a great tactic, Kathleen. Sorry to Thank cut you. you off, Alex, but no, I, go ahead. I I think that's that's a great tactic. And again, it, it's kind of builds to your credibility. Like, hey, I've done this before. I'm mm -hmm. comfortable doing it. And here are some examples so you can, you know, make sure that I'm really telling the truth. So <laughs> good good ups on you for for doing that and for not getting any no's. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just I'm just winging it right now. <laughs> I think, you know, I think some of us, I won't say everyone, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are not, but even myself, I wing it sometimes. And hey, you never know till you try something, right? Yep. Uh, everything I do is an experiment, more or less. I'm always just like testing new things. And uh, I've even, uh, Kathleen, I'm glad you brought this point and thinking about what Urban brought up as well, like video. So I've, I've definitely incorporated the links as well, which I think is really smart. Uh, and then I've actually done a little bit with video. And it's funny, I've tried it with this setup I have here. So I've recorded it right on the computer. Um, and that's done okay. Uh, I've done it where I basically follow more of a script, which has not worked at all. But what's actually worked the best is I'm holding my iPhone now is actually just walking around my house recording on this and keeping it under a minute. And literally just explaining why I'd want the person as a guest, like just as transparently as I can. And sometimes I like stumble over my words a little bit and I don't re record it. I just keep on going. And that's actually gotten me a better response than any other form of video that I've done. Now I don't always do that, but that's actually worked pretty well for me. It looks kind of informal, uh, but I just do my best to be very respectful in it and keep it brief. I find if it's over a minute long or I'm just guessing, I don't know if people would be interested anymore. So I try to keep as brief as I can. And then it allows me to make my email even shorter. Um, and now it sounds like after talking to Jared, what I'm missing is I just need to upload like uh, a little bit more about like, I don't know, maybe some of the cover art from the show or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, so I've had a little bit of experience with the video. And it's done pretty well for me. I like to drop your name a lot too, Jared, Alex. You what now? I drop your name. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Everybody that you told me to, I think they would be a great fit has actually had me on their show. There you go. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. I mean, that, that's important too, is, is who, you know, and actually Jared, we, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, do you find that once you've made a good connection that you can kind of ride off of that a little bit? Or, what are your thoughts on that? Or is that kind of abusive of a relationship? I don't know. And Kathleen, use me all you want, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, uh, I don't know that we, we've leveraged that all that much directly. I think more indirectly and kind of back to my example and the one that you mentioned as well, Alex, about... Uh, you know, the friend, kind of that friend aspect, being familiar with someone who you've already worked with before, um, that has worked tremendously well for us. And I, I really, I can't think of, of even one time that I've gone back to a journalist that I've worked with and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to reach a colleague of yours, but they're not responding. Um, and I think I'm in a unique situation as the, the person who books guests because I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of journalists. There, there's no shortage of them. They're very easy to find on Twitter and online and everywhere else. So I think for me, um, you know, it's again, that hasn't been an example that I've necessarily leveraged or used. 
And now I'm wondering why I haven't, because <laughs> I'm sure there's probably a lot more opportunities that I could have secured doing that. That's pretty funny, man. I mean, you know, we're like, like we just already said, like we're all learning and growing as we go. And even though I consider you to be a major uh, professional in this space, still we can all learn and, and grow along the way. Um, mm -hmm. So does anyone else have any questions? I, I didn't actually get, leave it open if, if anyone else had something they want to ask. Uh, I can't see everyone's screen, so feel free to just unmute and ask something if you want to. If not, I'll keep on going in a second here, but I'll I'll stop briefly and make sure no one has a question here. All right, back to it. Love it. I'm okay with that. Um, so going back to what we're pitching specifically, again, those two key components. Uh, what are you uh, What are you pitching, and be specific about it, and then what's relevant to them in the audience. Going back to what we're actually pitching again to be a guest on their show or to have them on our show. Um, when you say get specific, how have you been able to do this in a really brief way? Like even people that maybe are pitching to be on your show or that you're pitching to have them on your show, however that outreach usually goes, what do you find usually works? And like, how specific do we need to get really? I think for me, the biggest thing is just, is making sure that it's the right type of guest. That's, that's like first and foremost. Okay. Cause we, I, we've gotten a lot of people who have said, you know, I have an agency owner or I have this person who I want to be on your show. But if they're not a journalist, we don't work with them. And, and I hate to say that because I would love this. I would love the opportunity to work with everybody who's interested. But for us, it's really when it comes down to it, it's the guest. And we surprisingly, we don't get pitched very often by journalists to come on our show. There's only been maybe two occasions that I can recall at the top of my head. And one of them, which which kind of sticks out of my mind, it was from um, a publication that's that's recently been shut down. It's called Mel Magazine. And they were started by Dollar Shave Club. And one of their uh, PR reps had contacted me about their deputy editor. Her name was Alana. Uh, Alana Hope Levinson was her name. And it was a very, very simple email. She just said, hey, you know, I'd love to pitch you uh, or I'd love to pitch Alana to be a guest on your show. She's the depu deputy editor of Mel Magazine. And then she went on to elaborate a little bit about what Mel Magazine was and their audience, probably within two to three sentences. And so, again, just kind of trying to keep that succinct and just be very blunt and specific. She didn't have any like fluffy words or fluffy sentences or anything like that. It was just very specific and very direct. Here's Alana. Here's her role. Here's the company that she works for. And here's what they do. And of course, you know, we said yes, uh, especially given just how unique that magazine was. Um, and also, again, just because it was it was a good fit, we knew right away, okay, she's a journalist. All right, that checks the box. Now let's, you know, dive in a little bit deeper to see what, um, you know, what types of stories she writes and the publication that she works for to make sure that's also a fit for our audience. Very cool. To play the opposite side of what you just shared, do you ever find that there is a role that storytelling can play in this? Because we all know that storytelling is, in, in, if someone can tell a good story, it's very engaging. Have you ever seen anybody or you ever tried to do a pitch that somehow had a, a short story in it that was obviously relevant, not just something random to get people interested, but like more so, hey, here's why I'm reaching out or why I think you'd be a good fit type of thing. Have you seen that at all or does that not really relate to this? You know, I haven't seen it so much, um, nor have I done it myself, at least in, in terms of pitching for podcasts um, on the, you know, on the, the brand side, on the public relations side, by all means. I mean, people are pitching constantly about that stuff, especially through our platform. But it's, it's not something that I've, I've seen all that often from a pitch perspective, but come to think of it, you know, when you listen to a show, like, for example, I listen to How I Built This a lot, um, and, or Masters of Scale is another one with Reed Hoffman. And that's, I mean, that's just a full on narrative that's going on. So it would make perfect sense why you would want to kind of, like, as your hook, right, like have that within your pitch to the specific show. Um, and one of the examples that I was going to mention, or one of the tactics is just learning about the show that you're reaching out to. Um, especially again, if you want to be a guest on that show, knowing, you know, what is the format? Is it all an interview? Is it, you know, an interview with a little bit of, you know, sharing your expertise and things like that. So making sure that you listen to a couple of episodes, get a feel for how that format is, that can also play well into the pitch. So you can craft it in a very similar way. Again, you don't have to make it a, a huge long list, but if you can touch on those points that are typically touched on within the interview, it shows that you not only you know, know what you're talking about, but you've listened and you're really drawing the correlation as to why you're a good fit. That's great, man. This makes me think of a, of a point that something that I started doing. 
I'm a bit of an administrative person, like naturally, like administration is not like a struggle for me usually. Like I can keep things on par. But what I was doing is I was reaching out to people to have them as guests. I was also explaining like the administrative stuff, which now I realize I shouldn't have been doing, but like I wanted them to feel like, oh, he's definitely gonna handle all of it. But I'd be like, hey, we'll record for 45 minutes. I will send you a link for this. We'll send this, here's what all I need. And I include all that in my initial outreach. For me being like really administrative like that, I was like, that puts me at ease. But I learned a better way to do that. Instead of giving all that detail they don't need yet, I, I just have one line that basically says, I can handle all the administrative later. I've got it all set up in a template. Uh, if you're interested, I'll, I'll send you those details, but I won't bore you with them for now. And just doing that makes it feel a lot more human. Um, that's something that helps and keeps it like a little bit shorter as well. Um, something you said just really kind of sparked that thought. And I think it's really important to mention that we don't need to include all those details in our initial outreach because it just, it gets really informationally heavy, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I kind of, I think of this analogy of like, uh, <laughs> like if you're asking somebody out on a date and they haven't said yes yet, and you've already scheduled the reservation for two and you're telling them what time and where, and they're like, well, I haven't said yes yet. <laughs> you know, you don't want to kind of get ahead of yourself in that sense. So I, I totally agree. Very I, confident, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, right. <laughs> or there could be another word for that. But uh, like for me, I, I do all of my administrative in the very last email after they've confirmed the date and the time. Okay, great. You're all set. You have the link. Here's a couple of notes to remember for the day of. All you have to do is show up. You don't have to do anything else. Love that. That's smart. Um, I want to kind of transition here to, well, real quick, anybody have a question there before I move on? I'm going to kind of transition a little bit here. Feel free to unmute if you have a question. No, we're good. I got a question if nobody else has one. Go for it, man. Hug them all. No, you're good. Um, I'm asking a lot. So I'm still, I'm still beating you as far as uh, questions are concerned, Nathan. So go for it. All right. So um, kind of like Alex said, he uh, was talking about sending past episodes but he's doing it more from a host perspective if we're pitching something and it's a topic that's relevant to that particular host would you recommend sending like a previous episode that is kind of along the same lines as what you have already done before to them to give them an example yeah yeah absolutely one one thing i wouldn't do is pitch them on the same the same like you know, talking points that were done, unless it's, you know, you can't get past that, but providing those examples, I would, I would hundred percent agree is very important. It kind of, it goes back again to kind of that credibility and just the, the, the trust and understanding that this person, you know, has done this before they're comfortable with it. Um, and even if, you know, you're pitching a podcast that could have, you know, thousands of downloads per episode versus one that only has, you know, tens or maybe a hundred, um, I think it's still important to, to kind of give that as an additional uh, resource or as an additional point, again, to kind of prove that this person can, can do it, which we all know at the end of the day, it's not impossible to do, but for some reason, some shows, you know, they may say no, cause they don't think that person has the, the skills or the confidence or whatever it may be, but yeah, include those links by all means. I would say if you have a lot, um, consider only sharing maybe two or like the most recent two, um, you know, you don't want to send them a list of like five or 10 or anything like that, but if you can send them at least a couple, then should definitely help your chances. So you said, um, not on the same points that you made, but can it be like on the same topic? Yeah. Yeah. And I think again, I mean, it's, it's tough. Um, it's tough to answer without knowing like, you know, like a direct example. Um, yeah. but it, it's, when I think about that, I think back to like pitching in the PR space where you don't. You don't want to write an, an, an author doesn't want to write an article they've already written about somebody else. So it's kind mm -hmm. of making sure like, hey, you know, this is a past episode, but of course, you know, we want to talk about something different or we want to talk about the same stuff, but we want to do it, you know, within your format. Um, so I, I don't want you to like pay too close attention to that particular point. Again, I think it's uh, it's really matters about the context. But yeah, including that will be really, really, really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So transitioning to kind of this this final point I want to get across and we'll talk more about what you're doing, uh, Jared, you and your team, but real mm -hmm. quick, leading with value. What is your thought on this? Is there something that you would say that we can do to kind of start off with already building the relationship properly? Um, what are your thoughts on leading with value? Yeah. You know, I think there, I got to think about this one, Alex. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. I mean, you so for me, on the spot. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I, all these questions been on the spot. Like I said, this is a pretty chill conversation here. Um, yeah. For me, something that I do when I'm trying to pitch a guest that maybe 
historically doesn't do a lot of guesting. Like we have some people on Podmatch that, that they're on Podmatch, but they're not looking to get on a hundred podcasts. Like they're just looking for like maybe one a month. So if they're mm-hmm. getting pitched a lot, how do I get mine to be one of them that's chosen, right? So something I've usually done is I try to go, if they have a book that they're promoting, I like to go to Amazon and and take a look at some of the reviews and stuff. And I'll, I'll simply be like, hey, I'm going to check out your book. Just want to let you know I'm grabbing a copy. I'll leave a review afterwards, but also love to have you on the podcast. That to me is kind of like the idea of leading with value. And I, I have to believe it at least increases my chances a little bit because now I've already done something for them. Not that I'm trying to manipulate them and get them to say yes, just because I, I did so I helped you, you got to help me now. But at the end of the day, I want to do something to stand out if they're getting a, a lot of people reaching out to them, right? And if they're looking for one a month and 10 people are looking or going after them, I've got a 10% chance. So I do anything to increase that. Um, that's kind of my idea on that. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts if I gave you time to think there a little bit, Jared, but didn't mean to put you on the spot with that one. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. I, I kind of had a little brain fart and I needed an example. <laughs> there you go. Direction. Um, but no, I think that's a great point. And that's something that, that we especially have done in the past um, from that perspective. Um, you know, we, we, of course, we share download numbers. Um, we share with them how many guests we've interviewed. Uh, but a big thing, especially with journalists right now, is a lot of them are writing books or they're going away from newsrooms and starting newsletters or starting newsletters in tandem with that. So we're, we're kind of doing the same tactic where, hey, you know, not only do we wanna talk about you, but we wanna help promote this cool thing that you're doing. We wanna drive more eyes and more attention to it for you, or not for you, but to help you, you know, not that they can't do it, but they understand the value of, of getting in front of more people and, you know, kind of like getting that aspect of virality, if you will. Um, so again, from that value perspective, here's our show, here's what we do. And we also know that you're doing some cool stuff and we want to help share that with other people. I think it's really cool. I think that getting creative with how you lead with value is, is really kind of a, for me, a fun part of it. Like some people Mm -hmm. don't have books. I use the Amazon example as a really easy one. Other people have got to do a little bit more research and stuff like that. But I always think it's fun to somehow, some way find something you can throw in there. Um, I know it's helped me a lot. So I'm I'm glad you, you spoke to that point as well, Jared. So um, transitioning here once again, um, anybody have any questions on that before I move on? Nope. Cool. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk for a minute about, about one pitch, one pitch.co. Uh, who is this for? What does it do? Can it help podcasters at all? Either on the guest or host. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that for a little bit here. Yeah. One pitch. Uh, so we, I keep saying PR people a lot and they are not, they're not just people, they're PR professionals. <laughs> um, but really when it, when it comes down to a lot of the folks that we work with, we are of course working with um, professionals in the public relations space, whether they work for an agency or in-house uh, we work a lot, same thing with marketers, marketers who are working in-house or on behalf of an agency. Those two roles are kind of becoming more blended than ever before. Um, we also work a lot with startups and we work a lot with founders who are trying to get, you know, their name or their product or their company just kind of out into the public space. And I think, you know, from a podcast perspective right now, our database is not, we don't yet have podcasts in our database. And I'm, I'm actually glad you said this, um, cause I was thinking about this before coming on the show and surprisingly, not a lot of the other company PR companies, even the larger ones, they are just now starting to integrate podcasts into their databases. Um, and what I mean by databases, again, you know, you can go in, you can search through there, you can type in a couple of key terms, and it'll give you a list of uh, of the people who are going to most closely match what you're looking for. Um, so I hate to say there's not a lot of value on the podcast side yet. Uh, we are actually working on some partnerships, though, with some of these larger providers and looking at potentially integrating their database into our service. So that way we can give folks the opportunity to be able to contact influencers as well as journalists, as well as podcasts. Um, but I don't want to mention any names, so I'm not going <laughs> to give any competitors names out there, unfortunately. But yeah, yeah for, for us, really, again, when it comes down to it, we, we really help with press and we help with folks getting in touch with trade publications with top tier and national and regional publications um, to get their names inside of there, to get their you know stories told, to get their companies mentioned and that sort of thing. That's pretty cool. And you know, I, I knew this about kind of the, the PR industry as a whole, that podcasting is still just working its way in there. What, what do you see like from your perspective that the future looks like for podcasters in this space? Do you think it's going to be a very slow integration or do you see that it's just going to take off at some point? No, I think it's really going to take off. 
Um, and I think it kind of has already started. Um, just thinking about podcasts that are PR focused, for example, two, two to three years ago when we launched our podcast, there was maybe one or two total that were more PR, less journalism, if you will. Now, you know, there's dozens of them. Um, and again, now that these, these larger service providers have integrated that opportunity to pitch podcasts, it's become part of everyone's strategy. Um, and, you know, again, you can look at the reports, you can look at the articles on many of these different websites, um, but that's very much something that people are, are not um, neglecting anymore. I think the influencer kind of craze has like died down a little bit. Um, and I think partially just because, you know, there was like this idea of like, okay, these people are legit. They're not legit. I got to pay for it. I don't got to pay for it. I think podcasting, you know, as a medium, you reach so many people. There's so many opportunities to listen, whether it be through Spotify or through iTunes or, um, you know, all the other platforms that you can post on. So I think it's, it's at a point where people are, have recognized that it's important and they're really starting to take advantage of it. Very cool, man. That, that makes me pretty excited for what you guys are doing over there. So I'm personally going to look into a little bit more and everybody, I, I dropped it in the chat, but again, it's onepitch.co. Definitely check that out and connect with, with Jared. Jared, this has been a lot of fun, man. I've really enjoyed this time with you here. I'd love to hear if you have any final thoughts on this topic we've been covering. And I know I'm just throwing you on the spot again with a question there, but if you have any final thoughts for us today, I'd love that for you to kind of leave us with some value here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I would say at the end of the day, um, if, if you're pitching to be a guest, just remember you're, you know, you're, in a sense, like Kathleen said, we're winging it. Um, <laughs> we got to kind of just figure it out as we go. Don't get disgruntled. Don't be bummed. If, if you don't get the right response, sometimes it's not the right time. Sometimes it's not the right fit. Um, but just keep persevering, keep pushing, keep trying. You, you, you're going to get somewhere. Trust me. I didn't get where I am without trying and pushing and persevering. Um, and I will say this much as well. Uh, again, I know that one pitch is not so much on the podcasting side yet, but just from a pitching perspective, I think there's a lot of carryover between what PR folks are doing and what you would want to do for a podcast. Our blog at one pitch is called the type bar. We have a ton of resources for pitching. Um, we have templates that will kind of give you an idea of how you'd want to craft and formulate a pitch. We've got a ton of interviews with our podcast guests on there. Um, so if you're kind of curious about this space and looking to learn a little bit more, again, the type bar on our, on our website would be a great resource for you guys to look into. Love it, man. Hey, Jared, thanks again for being here, man. I really appreciate your time today and sharing all this wisdom with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Alex and everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, and thank you for all the great questions too. It was really fun to be here and to uh, share a little bit of insight with you guys. Absolutely. Thanks again, man. Yep.